production of Kansas City Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. After almost two years of debate and public pressure, Kansas City police finally putting on body cameras, but for how long? The streetcars are now so crowded, the city wants to buy two more and expand the route north without a public vote. Plus, why have puppies replaced the airport as one of the city's top priorities? And the New York Times praising Sam Brownback. Is it time for a reappraisal of the Kansas governor? Hello and welcome. I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more straight ahead on Week in Review, connecting the dots on your local news of the week. He is the host of Up to Date on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske. From the Kansas City Star's business and development beat, Steve Bockrot. From the pages of the Call newspaper, Eric Wesson. And dissecting the news at KCMO Talk Radio, Mike Ferguson. Police shootings causing angst and protests around the country again this week. Now, after almost two years of debate, though, Kansas City police finally begin using body cameras for the first time this week, at least on a test basis. See a red light that comes on on the top there? Uh, that means it's recording. For the next 90 days, 25 Kansas City officers will be wearing cameras like this one. Having resisted this for so long and claiming this was not a panacea, why now, Eric Wesson? Uh, because of public pressure, public outcry, there's funding available for it. I think they've worked out the bugs on what they're going to allow people to have access to. Uh, so we'll see. A lot of people are under the impression that more focus needs to be put on training than the little gadgets like that because we've seen the video cameras and we still haven't seen a lot of police officers come to justice yet. So it really doesn't matter what people see on the cameras. Uh, it's more into what's going to be done as far as prosecuting officers for And isn't that one of the issues, murders. Mike Ferguson, that even when you have this, this video footage, it is still open to interpretation or you don't always get a full portrait of what was actually happening? Well, because you don't always see what happened before the camera was turned on and therein lies so much of the controversy. But one of the interesting things is in other cities where cameras have been used uh, on a widespread basis, police complaints against police have gone down. Uh, one of the biggest issues isn't just that the cameras are $300, $800 each. That's on the grand scale, not that much. It's the cost of archiving all of the video mm -hmm. that's caused a lot of cities to really kind of reconsider how are we going to do this. I think it's something that is going to happen across the country. It's a matter of how are we going to pay for it because when you spend money on that video, you can't spend some money on something else, and that's, that's the debate. Steve. You mentioned that you know some people think that these body cameras are not going to be the, the panacea for providing uh, you know absolute clarity in what happens with all these police encounters, but you know it, it, it's a piece of evidence uh, among several others, and that's always how it is. There's never one piece of evidence that's really, or rarely, just one thing that's always demonstrative in, in cases like this. And it seems like having these body cameras will provide more clarity and more information probably rather than less. But one of the big issues, and we talked about it on last week's program, Steve Kraske, was the issue of trust and the police. Yeah. Irrespective of all of the uh, problems, perhaps, and challenges and obstacles relating to body cameras, if there's a concern about public trust, you need to have these cameras at least to take that away from the ammunition from the public to say that they are not, um, you know, that that is one of the causes of concern, another barrier from police and the public. You know, it's amazing the lack of trust, the lack of faith these days between police and the, pop the populace. My students at UMKC, the folks I teach, they tell me all the time how nervous they are around police officers and how anxious they get. I think Eric Wesson just hit the nail on the head here, this notion that public pressure is forcing police to go this route is exactly what's going on here. I think police these days need to do everything they possibly can to show transparency, to show good faith. This is one step down that road. And, and it still leaves a lot of discretion up to the officer because the officer is the one that turns it on and off. That's right. So at what point does he turn it on? Uh, the last shooting that they had where they were claiming that the victim had a gun, well, you couldn't really see because the video was so distorted. And in addition to that, if there's a situation where police comes in a home, if I'm sitting in a home, I don't have anything to do with it. When he comes in, it 
videotapes and records everything that's going on in the house. I haven't done anything. They weren't looking for me. Now I'm a part mm -hmm. of this process. Mm -hmm. And it opens the door for other forms of harassment by the police department. Mike, so I don't if, think it's really that good of a thing. If I'm an honest, good, well-trained cop who does my job ethically, I want a body camera to protect me. The question comes down to who's got the body camera. And like Eric said, when does it come on? The issue of crime was in the news a lot this week, including in the race for president, where at their first debate, the candidates squabbled over whether violent crime was going up or down. It's continued to drop, including murders. So there no, you're is... Wrong. You're wrong. No, I'm murders not. Murders are up. Yeah. All right, you check. New York. This week, the FBI releases its new national crime figures and finds murders up nearly 11% across the country. And Kansas City is singled out as one of the cities contributing to that double-digit rise. Kansas City's murder rate listed in the new FBI data as fifth highest in the country. What's been the response from city leaders and local law enforcement to that unflattering portrayal in these latest national crime figures, Eric? Really nothing. Uh... Is you go to one spot, you get it together, and then murders or crime escalate in another area. It's, it's like ch a dog chasing its tail. What do you do and what's the right formula? What do you do? How do you engage people into doing the right thing, number one? And number two, how do you engage people in saying what's going on in the community with these murders? Again, we've got this gap between the police and the community, but these families are knowing who's committing these murders as well. Steve? You know, I think homicides is a really risky barometer by which to measure crime and, and mayhem in a city. The numbers in Kansas City have bounced around for years. A couple of years ago, we, we had a, a dip, and everyone began to think, hey, we've really begun to conquer the homicide scourge in this community, and that hasn't proven to be the case. The tricky thing, the discouraging thing for Kansas City, Nick, is that these, these mechanisms that have been put in place, the No Violence Alliance, Aim for Peace, these these, these tools that have been employed the last few years to begin to deal with this, hoping for a panacea, they're not panning out. I think that's led to, to some discouragement in the police ranks and among community leaders here. Where do we go from here? Because the numbers have bounced back up again. Historically in Kansas City, they've been over 100 for a very long time. That's where we're going to be again this year. On the national uh, violent crime and murder figures, um, Steve Vonkrot, uh, those critics are saying, well, don't look at these numbers in isolation here. Relatively speaking, we are actually are relatively low homicide rates. This is an aberration because we're looking at uh, small numbers, and that means that in, uh, a small increase can look huge over one year. Is that true of Kansas City, too? Well, Kansas City, as Steve pointed out, has kind of had a, a, a bumping around a little bit. It seems like 100 homicides is sort of like this uh, line whereby people measure what the, what the homicide rate is. And Steve's also right. I mean, there's a lot of other ways to measure crime uh, beyond, just, uh, beyond just homicides. But, you know, statistics, as, as we all know too well, particularly in political debates like this, is you can use them one way or the other. Yes, it's true that crime has been down since the early 90s, I think even further back than that. Um, but looking at it one year and saying homicides are up versus the year before is not a, a, a terribly convincing body of evidence. Mike, homicides are a result of things that happened before the gun was fired or the knife was thrust, uh, but also you have to look at the impact uh, after it. We're looking at, in Kansas City proper, a murder about every three days. When you're looking at the entire metro area, about one every two days, and that affects things like where do people go after hours to spend their money, where do people go to invest in education as well. And I did notice, uh, Eric Wesson, that the Justice Department nationally giving Kansas City, the Kansas City Police Department, the Jackson County Prosecutor's Department, more than a million dollars collectively now for new crime prevention activities in Kansas City, that's got to help. And that goes on top of the other millions of dollars that they gave them a few years ago. Uh, Casey Nova and the police uh, bragged about rounding up 34 dangerous felons uh, and then the next day, you had two homicides. So people were joking on Facebook that they rounded up the wrong 34 people. But when we get into the situation with crime, where do you go? It's like Steve said, you got Nova, you got Aim for Peace, you got all of these fly-by-night uh, groups that are getting funded. Where's the money going? 
We can't find the solution, Nick. That's why this problem goes on year after year. Quick Band-Aid solution remedies don't work. Sister Berta at Operation Breakthrough will tell you, you fix poverty in this community, you fix crime. Other people will say, you get people jobs, you fix crime. Still others you know, will say something like education. education. That's the answer for everything. Those things cost big dollars. They're multifaceted. A multifaceted approach appears to be the answer here, but, but it's not happening because so much money would be required to fix these mega problems that contribute to the homicide rate in Kansas City. Isn't that what the Crime Commission is supposed to be finding out? Well, okay. <laughs> we will get to that on another program because they will be reporting back at the end of the year. Uh -huh. To the dismay of its critics and the glee of its backers, Kansas City's new streetcar line records a string of successes this week. First in court where a judge rules that a petition effort to expand the line is legal and those plans to create a separate transportation district to help pay for that is not unjust or unreasonable. Meanwhile, streetcar leaders say the vehicles have been so crowded they're working on adding two more cars to the line and are investigating expanding the route north by about three quarters of a mile so it extends to Berkeley Riverfront Park, a move they contend can happen without a public vote. Steve Ockrott, how can that be? Well, so the Transportation Development District, which is a special taxing district that they've established downtown, is already in place. It's collecting revenues. It's collecting more revenue than they anticipated. And so they don't need to do a public vote if they can just fund it within the existing taxing district. They can just pay for it off their, off their balance sheet or some other way, but uh, that wouldn't trigger a vote to my understanding. But what would be, so the effort up until this point has been talking about expanding it south of Kansas City. Why this particular route to Berkeley Riverfront Park? I think it's just to provide a more complete route within the existing boundaries that they already have. Um, and, you know, as, as you mentioned, they want to add a couple of more cars. A separate process is, uh, is underway to try to expand southward to UMKC Plaza area, and that would, of course, require uh, a but series that, of But that votes. effort, though, even though the judge ruling on that case saying, yep, that, that effort is legal, has been delayed, hasn't it? Yeah, they delayed it. Um, I think it was a, a, a bit of a political trade-off. I think Kansas City political leaders who are kind of, they're separate from this process, right? This is a citizen effort that's being led for the expansion. City Hall is detached from it, and their concern was, they want to issue these bonds for public infrastructure in April. They want to have a vote on it, and they're concerned that if you have these streetcar elections and the specter of taxes going up in certain areas and then broadly in the city for the infrastructure, voters might get uh, perturbed about that and they might lose votes for the infrastructure deal. Okay. Well, streetcar expansion then is still in the, in the future. There is a more imminent decision you're going to be making in a few weeks if you're a fan of expanded transit. Maverick act activist Clay Chastain has been in town making the case for his 40-mile light rail plan that will appear on the November ballot a plan that's going to improve the mobility for all of our people around the city, and especially an emphasis on our low-income people that often have to take three hours and three buses to get to a job. That's not right. Now, the system Chastain proposes would connect the center of the city to KCI Airport with two eastward legs to the Truman Sports Complex and the zoo and to the new Cerna campus in South Kansas City with no streetcar expansion question muddying the water doesn't make this make this proposal more viable in the eyes of voters, Steve Kraske? You know, I don't think it does, Nick. I don't think it does for a simple reason, and that is that the price tag for Clay Chastain's plan is $2 billion. And I think people, once they begin to wrap their arms around exactly how ambitious Clay's plan is, are going to walk away and walk away in droves. Mike. And it also takes money away from the bus system. And there, you still have to pay to ride the uh, streetcar, or I'm sorry, not the streetcar, but you have to pay to ride the uh, light rail under his plan as well. And it assumes that the federal government is going to fund it with no actual promise from the federal government to fund it. But, but you heard Clay Justin talking about, you know, this is really about people who are not being served now, many of them on the east side. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out where they would be taken. <laughs> A bus that takes them three hours to get to work. Where would they be going <laughs> on that bus? But uh, Toledo, you Ohio, know, it's an ambitious plan. If we were in Atlanta or Houston or a large metropolitan area where people made a lot of money, it would be a great concept. But in Kansas City, it's a bad plan. Well, some people are upset that city leaders are spending too much time and money on these big projects like streetcars and 
building new airport terminals and they're just forgetting the basics like fixing crumbling sidewalks and sewer systems. In other words, basic infrastructure. Well, city leaders are now preparing to ask you to pay $800 million to fix up city streets and pavements. But as talking about infrastructure may not be seductive enough to voters, they are adding puppies to the mix. <laughs> the signature item in next April's proposed election will now be a new animal shelter for Kansas City's four-legged friends. Do city leaders not think they can pass this if they simply talk about new pavement and sewer pipes? They have to add cute kittens and precocious puppies to take it across the finish line, Steve? Well, the thing that's hard, about, there, there are a lot of things that are difficult about this campaign. One of them is that to pay for the bonds that they want to issue, they're contemplating likely a property tax increase. Property tax increases are generally not that popular. Um, you know, they, they, there will be arguments that they have a disproportionate effect on people, say, who have fixed incomes or live, uh, uh, live in poverty. And so, so it's going to be tough from that standpoint. However, as you point out, a lot of people criticize City Hall. They say, you know, you guys are, as you say, they work on these big projects and, you know, say that they can't pick up the trash on time and things like that or fix sidewalks. And this bond issue would go a long ways towards fixing a lot of those issues. Um, it's just a question of whether people want to pay for it or if they make the argument, hey, City Hall, you guys should have been doing this stuff all along. Um, you know, cities and states defer maintenance all the time, so Kansas City's not unique in that respect, but it's sort of a, you know, rubber meets the road moment for, uh, for Kansas City residents about what decision they're going to make on this. But what about the addition of the animal shelter then, that, uh, that the actual infrastructure is, is not important enough for many voters to approve? You have to add something big and splashy to it. $800 million is what happens when you kick the can down the road for generations, but who doesn't love puppies, who doesn't love kittens? I'm not sure that uh, City Hall's gotten the response from the adding the animal shelter to the mix that they thought they were gonna get from it, uh, because I think a lot of people look at a $14 million public uh, addition to this program and say, we do have other priorities. But didn't we resolve this with the last sales tax increase? Wasn't that supposed to go for the sewers, the sidewalks, and the infrastructure? So you, you're talking we, about the one percent sales tax that's already in place for right, infrastructure. Right, right. That was supposed to cover that, and then you got the other things. I don't know if taxing people again to do the same things that you said you were already going to do is going to be the answer to that. I don't care if you put puppies on there or raccoons. Well, that might be right, but, 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 but there is a constituency in Kansas City that has been clamoring for basic improvements yes. forever. That was how yes. Mayor Mark Funkhauser got elected, basic services, taking care of the, the meat and potato stuff we have to do here. I think Steve Vakrod is exactly right. This is a, a defining moment for the city. Folks are demanding basic services. Well, that comes with a price tag. The 1% uh, item you just referred, referred to, uh, uh, Nick, that doesn't cover it. It's 70 million bucks a year. Doesn't go far enough. City's too big. A defining moment here, 800 million bucks is what city leaders say we need to do to clean up our town. Speaking of infrastructure, if you've driven on I-70 through Kansas lately, you may have seen the signs featuring a masked robber and the caption, this is highway robbery, a million dollars a day taken from Kansas roads and bridges. The Kansas Contractors Association are behind those billboards. They are upset that Governor Sam Brownback is diverting money from state highway coffers to balance the state budget. But what effect is that really having? Well, according to a new study released this week, Kansas has the third best road system in the nation, up from fifth in the nation a year ago. The recent foundation's annual highway report tracks the performance of state owned highway systems in 11 categories, including highway spending, pavement and bridge conditions, traffic congestion and fatality rates. The office of Kansas Governor Sam Brownback was quick to seize on the study. Kansas media has largely failed to cover this new national report. Why, you ask, they say, because it didn't fit into their preconceived biased narrative. Does the study then offer a different take on what's happening in Kansas, Steve? Well. The, the administration, you could argue, has a, a bit of a narrative itself that it wants, uh, you know, they want people to understand that the roads are in great shape. And, you know, according to the study, they are. It's done by a think tank that um, has libertarian leanings and privatization leanings as well. So let's take, let's, let's accept the study as fact that Kansas roads are in good shape now. We just talked about, you know, states and the cities have the tendency to kick the can down the road. And if the state neglects to fund adequately highways over a number of years and they get in bad shapes. That's a tremendously expensive thing you have to fix later on. And so 
you know, Kansans aren't wrong to be concerned about uh, the, 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 the diversion of revenues from, or taxes from highway programs to fill other holes in the state's budget. Steve, the study looks at the roads today. The concern is the roads 5, 10, 15 years down the road, Nick. One accounting I've seen shows that $2.7 billion has been swept from Kansas highway funds in recent years to pay for current spending. The Kansas DOT is going to delay 10 projects in 2017, 15 more in 2018. The number of construction jobs in Kansas has tanked as a result of all this sweeping away of funds. The concern isn't what the study purports, which is the roads today, it's the roads down the road. All right. To borrow, it, that's a pun, Nick. It's yeah. been a hundred <laughs> years uh, in the making. But finally this week, President Obama officially opens the first museum in our nation's capital exclusively dedicated to telling the story of African Americans. But as the New York Times reports this week, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture might never have happened if not for a man from Kansas called Sam Brownback. A bill to create the museum was defeated 15 years in a row. Finally, in 2003, the Times makes clear, then Senator Sam Brownback encouraged other Republicans to get on board, and the museum proposal finally began to make progress. When Governor Brownback is beaten up then so frequently, does he deserve a feather in his cap for this? Eric? <laughs> I guess he does, if, if there is such a thing, because of... The museum, I was in D.C. a couple of weeks ago, right before the opening, and everybody's excited. It's a buzz. I don't know whether he put it over the finish line or set the tone for it, but uh, he's getting a lot of credit for it. And even when I was in D.C., people were giving him kudos for it. They said he's not doing anything any, anywhere else, but they were really, that's a great project. It's a great building. George W. Bush uh, specifically mentioned him in his opening remarks at the opening of the museum this week. Steve. I think Governor Brownback does deserve some credit for this. I wrote about it for our political blog, what people were saying about him. He had a really good reputation in Washington for working across the aisle, even with folks like Ted Kennedy, the liberal icon from Massachusetts. So Governor Brownback in those days, Senator Brownback did a lot of that work, Nick. Next on Week in Review, should taxpayers be troubled by double dipping? What are you doing? What? Did, did you just double dip that chip? Excuse me? You double dip the chip. You dip the chip. About that you kind of double it. dipping, I'm talking about the practice of government employees retiring, collecting a pension, and then going back to work on the public payroll. It's a front page story in the Kansas City Star this week as its red flags a behind the scenes effort in the Jackson County Legislature to change its pension rules to allow one of its own members to continue receiving his county pension, even though he's now claiming a salary as a member of the Jackson County Legislature. Gary Baker, who was just appointed to fill the seat vacated by Frank White, says he recently noticed his pension payment stop coming. I put in 33 years for the county, he says. I'm entitled to that. So what's the big deal, Mike? It happens more than you realize. I mean, when I was on Grandview's Board of Aldermen and on the, the Water District Board of Directors before that, we saw it uh, on a regular basis where somebody would retire and then take a job as a consultant or as a contractor, or they would simply work for a different uh, branch of the government in order to get their retirement and either work full-time or part-time and, and get that. So it, it happens quite a bit. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about it like this is an extreme case. It's really not. And, and you also hear the, about that in school districts too, yes. where teachers yes. and administrators oftentimes yep. have gone retired and then moved to another district and then also then gone back on the government payroll. Eric. And it happens with with state government. They come out of the state house, they term out, then they go into city council, they term out, and they get both of them. So, so, so what is the big deal about this story I don't then? Know what the big well, deal I, is. I think there's a public perception issue that double dipping is a bad thing. That pensions are reserved for folks at the point in their lives when they have retired and they need a steady income to sort of stay afloat. And this notion that you're getting two salaries jars a lot of people. So that's what is at root here behind this thing, Nick. 
Have you noticed Kansas City has tons of festivals? There's the Renaissance Festival, Irish Fest, Rock Fest, the Fringe Festival, the Ethnic Enrichment Festival, the Middle of the Map Fest, Boulevard here. There's a Greek Fest, the Spinach Fest, the Prairie Village Jazz Festival. Well, no, there's not enough of them. At least according to Kansas City Mayor Sly James, who says Kansas City is missing a signature festival. And it's time that changed. A key city council committee this week greenlighting the spending of a quarter of a million dollars to seek out and hire a project manager for the new event, which the mayor would like to see launched in September at Swope Park. And it would feature, among other things, a half-mile-long table where people from all walks of life would sit down to a meal together. Nobody is going to come to Kansas City to see the same thing that they saw in, in Chicago. They're going to come to see Kansas City, and we're going to showcase our stuff. Now, granted, no other festival in town currently has a half-mile-long picnic table so people could sit down together, but why does the mayor think all of these other big gatherings I mentioned come up short and we need something else to fill the void? I, I love the mayor's passion for what he's doing. By the time, if you say, please pass the uh, rolls, it's going to take a long time to get it for it. But the other thing is, yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to have a, uh, an organic community artsy event, I think getting government involved is probably the worst thing you could do to make that Steve happen. Steve Volkrodt. Well, I, you know, the, the, I would argue that the Plaza Art, art Festival is, 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 Art Fair is the, is the largest that we have right now. And it gets tremendous crowds. I suspect it's largely local. I think what the mayor's going for is something that can um, give people a reason to come to Kansas City um, and discover a town that they may have overlooked in the past. But, the, uh, the, but that's not achieved with all of the festivals we currently have, Eric? I thought it was. I thought it, people. <laughs> I thought we were doing a good job. I, I lose track of all the festivals well, he just that ran they them have. All down. And, he, and yeah. I'm, I, I applaud you for yeah. doing that. And that was just a fraction of them, though, Steve. <laughs> I think that's right. But I, I think you did a good job. Yeah, I, I agree with Mike. I think his passion is, is to be commended here. And people always like a good party, so why not do another one, Nick? I, I do a weekly arts interview on my program, and uh, what I'm being told over and over is that Kansas City is now on the national radar when it comes to arts. There's a lot of great things that are happening in arts, and, and maybe we ought, to, we ought to fully exploit what we have going on right now. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers, Steve Kraske from the uh, KCUR, and Eric Wesson from The Call, Steve Vokrot, and uh, who from Kansas City Star, and Mike Ferguson of KCMO Talk Radio. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.